Okay. We're getting ready to go live here. We are live. All right, everybody. This is John and Rob Coanker Corner. Uh, tonight's special guest we have is uh, so she's the one who is, is leading the um, the phys. Let's go, Barb. Good. I can't hear John at all, though. Yeah, John lost. Hey, John, I can't hear you. We've heard absolutely nothing you've said. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's a good thing. I'm not sure. <laughs> he'll get tuned in here in a second. All right, he said he'll be back. <laughs> it must gonna be reboot everything. Yeah. He's had an awful lot of uh echoing. Yep, yep. Yeah, but, we can uh, talk. All, yep. For all listeners, uh, I want you to introduce yourself, Miss Barbara. Say I know a little bit about you. I've heard a lot about you, but if you want to introduce <laughs> yourself to all the uh guests and viewers out there, uh kind of introduce what you've done and kind of your experience if you don't you don't mind. Okay. Um my name's Barb Elliott. For those of you that don't know, I'm the uh BASS New York Conservation Director for New York State. I've been doing that, I'm not sure, 14 years or so, thereabouts. And a lot of you may know me from the fizzing promotion they do up in the, especially when they fish the St. Lawrence and Northern Waters um, for barrow trauma relief. And um, I do Every year when the elites come, I, I train the anglers that haven't been through the training before. Um, so Bass has me train all the anglers and anybody else that wants to know too. Gotcha. Uh, so it's it's a lot of fun. Um, even on that level, people struggle with holding the needle and stuff a little bit sometimes. It's pretty easy technique. Once you do a few fish, you should be an expert too. So. We've been working on getting people doing this for, I've been doing it for 13 years now. So, wow. Yeah, it's been a long time. I should have been out. Of, it's so easy. I should have been out of a job two years after I started, but <laughs> I'm still doing this. So, anyway. But yeah, it's a great topic. I mean, we all need to get better and learn more. I mean, we can always learn more about that. I think I might be fizzing, back. So, great topic. Yeah, we can hear you now, John. You still get broken up a little, but okay. There that may is. be a bad thing. <laughs> Hello, Remo. <laughs> Remo's here. <laughs> yeah, if any anyone yeah, wants Remo to, Remo and Daniel Kenny's here. He said he'll, he'll see you at the uh, Fish Expo in New oh, England. Oh yeah, hi Dan. <laughs> yeah. That's always fun at the New England Fishing Expo. That's a great little midwinter thing to cure your cabin fever. Um, but anyways, it's 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 a real easy technique. Nobody should be afraid to try it because, uh, let's see, Jonathan, do you suggest fizzing all fish caught in the summer regardless of depth caught? Well, the problem, we talked about this a little earlier before we went live, but the litmus test to figure out whether a fish needs fizzing or not is to put them in your live well and see what they do. If you put a fish in your live well and he hangs at the surface, doesn't go to the bottom like he should, if he hangs at the surface or floats upside down or goes completely upside down or sideways, whenever they do that, you never see fish floating in nature. So if you put your fish that you've just caught, even if you caught them in two feet of water, you put your fish in the live well and observe what he does. 
And if he floats or stays at the surface, that fish needs to be fizzed. So it really, the depth you caught them at is really not the, de the determining factor. What the fish does when you put them in the live well, that's how you figure out who needs fizzing and who doesn't. If you catch a fish in 30 feet of water and put him in your live well and he doesn't float, I'd check him in a while, but you don't have to fizz that fish. You never see fish floating at the surface, you know, at the surface in nature at all. So that's not a natural position for them. They're very uncomfortable doing it and it stresses them terribly. So, Hey, there's Pam Horn. Hi, baby. How are you? <laughs> She's one of my biggest advocates down south. She gets a lot of people to do this technique. And I think the, pop the popularity of bass fishing now is so, there's bass? so many tournaments. Yeah. Um, we have to be better stewards at um at keeping the fish population sustainable because we don't really want the states in our business managing our bass any more than they already do on the size minutes size limits and stuff so we have to really take care of these fish and get them back in the water keep them wet and fizz them when they need it hey Audie, how are you <laughs> mr ottman long time no see yeah it's nice. Yeah, it seems like after COVID, after COVID, fishing just went because I went to my local lake and it's just kayaks everywhere. It was yeah. amazing. Yeah, I mean, if you catch and release a fish, there's no reason for you to to have to um to have to fizz that fish if right. you immediately release it. But we're fishing deeper for them all the time. I mean, it's at last year. An interesting story. Last year at the uh. St. Lawrence tournament. Nice. I had a guy come tell me he was fishing in, I don't know, 80 feet of water and he caught this fish and he put it in his live well and its stomach, he said its stomach came out through its mouth, but it really wasn't its stomach. It is its stomach, but it's the fizz, the fizz, uh, the swim bladder that's pushing the stomach out. Right. And he said he put it in there and then went and did a few things and then went back to fizz it and the fish was already dead. I mean, it nice. had a terrible, horrible acute case of barotrauma. And he says, what do you do when a situation like that? And I said, the only thing I can think of to do is the second you get your hands on that fish, you got to stick a needle in it because yep. it's come from so deep. So the next day, the first day of the tournament, he came to me and he, he told me, he said, that worked just fine. He said that he caught these fish in that deep water and he had the needle ready and he just instantly fizzed it. And the fit, he brought them to weigh in, and they were fine. So that's awesome. a that's a testament to how well the technique works. But you have to; it's so important to do it out on the boat or at catch time. The minute yeah. you see this fish exhibiting signs of barotrauma, you need to do it right then for it to be of the most benefit to the fish. So, anyways, I know there's a lot of lakes, a lot of states down south that don't have a lot of you know. A lot of call for fizzing fish but then there are a lot of deep reservoirs that you guys have that need it those little spots um oh, yeah. the oh where's the classic gonna be this this year um where is it hon tulsa oklahoma oh tulsa no i was thinking um where yeah hartwell the, yeah. those little spots oh my goodness they can they come up they just act like little bobbers floating yeah. in the in the live wells, they were those. A lot of those fish needed fizzing when the classic was down there. It was cold; they were deep. So, anyways, so any got another question? Let's see. Yeah, so that answered uh, fizzing all fish. I only only fizz them if they exhibit the signs and sim symptoms of barrow trauma, and. They can change. You can put a fish in the live well. It may not float right exactly then, but it could float later. So I, you can't check your fish too much in a day. I check my fish every time I stop from a run, before I go on a run, make sure my live wells are full. I check my fish throughout the day when we're fishing. I, I, I just, that's why you catch things that go wrong with your uh, live well when pumps stop and, you know, all of a sudden you open your live well and all your fish are right at the surface gasping for air. It's like, uh-oh, something's wrong. Yep. 
then you get the bucket out and bucket water in and you know you can keep them alive it's it's how hard you want to work at it so any more questions anybody got when i can't think Bob, i have of a question when yeah i have one Oh, he's typing it. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I can't. See. Oh, Jonathan. Yeah, asked, going on here? Jonathan asked about fin clips. Okay. Oh, um. Okay. The fin clips keep a fish oriented right side up. Um, it keeps them from flipping upside down and getting, um, exhausting themselves by trying to write themselves. But fin clips do not fix the internal problem. A lot of people use them. And for a marginally inflated fish, it might be enough to get them through the tournament. But still, it does not fix the internal problem. When the swim bladders are overinflated inside the fish, they put so much stress and pressure on the inside of that fish that it bruises organs and causes internal damage. So once this fish is inflated, the longer you leave it inflated, the worse the prognosis is for this fish living long-term after suffering post-tournament mortality. So, um, you know, do I have any direct measurements of that? No, because there are some studies done. Um, Canada does a lot more studies than we do as far as fizzing fish goes, but, um, I, I don't have any direct numbers, but due to the, the in, internal injury that overinflated swim bladders cause in the fish, um, it's really, it, it, I, don't, I don't ever use fin clips. If a fish is at the surface in your live well and you're, you notice it's not down in the bottom like it should be, the best thing to do is just fizz that fish. Um, you don't have to be nervous about sticking them with a needle. When you stick a fish with a needle through the side, um, all you go through is skin, muscle, and directly into the swim bladder. That swim bladder is a huge, empty, empty balloon when it's in the fish and it's overinflated. And that was the other thing. There's generations upon generations of people that have fizzed through the mouth. And yes... Even I used to fizz through the mouth 15 years ago. Um, that's the way we all learned. But Texas Parks and Wildlife Research and um, Stephen Cook and um, Canadian people, they've all done lots of research that shows it's very detrimental to the fish to fizz through the mouth. You can certainly access the swim bladder through the mouth of a fish but you also punch holes in two or three other organs that don't need extra holes in them. <laughs> that's, that's yeah. really bad. And that's a really good way to kill a fish post-release tournament mortality. Is there a difference in fizzing large mouth and small mouth? Um, there's no difference in the process. The process is all the same. You're looking for a neutrally buoyant fish, but where you insert the needle is different. And the, the kit that I have, let me get the picture out. I can show you uh, the difference. The largemouth is a lot longer fish. So where you put the, in the swim bladder itself is longer. So this is, if I can get that centered. This shows you the landmarks and where to find it. There's so much misinformation on the internet. Most of the stuff you read will tell you to count three scales back of the pectoral fin. Don't count scales off the pectoral fin. You use the landmarks, which is the fourth spiny ray, the base of the fourth spiny ray down to the, the, the anal pore down here, wherever it is. And then off the pectoral fin, whoops, I can't do this backwards. Off the pectoral fin, in a line straight back towards the notch on the tail. And the intersection between those two lines is the point that you're looking to insert the needle. 
um, on a bigger fish, if you count three scales back off the pectoral fin, there's a very good chance you'll completely miss a swim bladder. The, the beauty of the landmarks is that it moves this spot according to the size of the fish along that line. So you'll always, if you follow the landmarks, you will always be in the right spot. You'll never miss it. I mean, it's, it's incredibly easy, but you have to use the landmarks. And really when you lay this fish down on a, a surface, the intersection of that, those two lines will be the high spot on the side of the fish when you're laying him on something flat. Now for a large mouth, Let's see, get this centered. See how much further it is back? That star indicates, because in a large mouth, you use the notch between the two fins, the spiny ray and the soft ray. There's a notch there and a line down to the anal pore. And then the same off the pectoral fin until you reach that line. But it's much further back. The large mouth swim bladder is much longer. And you fizz spots the same way too. So there, there is a difference in location, but not in the actual process. Everything else is the same. And the, the really hardest part of fizzing a fish is determine neutrally buoyant fish. We'll go into that in a minute. It says, oh, Davey wants to know, Audie wants to know, do you sanitize fizzing needles after a certain number of uses? What I suggest to people is this... Oh, if you're going to use it in a tournament and fizz multiple fish, you can put a splash, and I mean just a splash, of rubbing alcohol in the bottom of this container. Just a splash. You don't want it soaking in there. And it, it will disinfect the tips of the needles. And you just have to make sure that when you take the needle out to use it, that you shake that needle off. Shake it make sure that it's dry and it doesn't have any chemical or alcohol in it. I don't recommend using any kind of harsh sanitizers because you don't want to accidentally introduce any of that into the swim bladder. Um, the, when you put fish in a live well, there's been a lot of research I've read and seen. People are worried about contaminating the fish. If you keep these reasonably clean and dry, protected in their little bottle, I don't worry much about contamination with the fish as long as they're clean and dry. To put it in perspective, how many people do you know that disinfect the treble hooks on their crankbaits in between each fish that they catch? Okay, when we hook fish with treble hooks, we're hooking them in the mouth, we hook them in the eye, we hook them in the belly, we hook them in the muscle. Does anybody ever disinfect a treble hook? No, they don't. No. Okay. Fish have immune systems just like we do. They get injured just like we do. So if you are reasonably clean, now if you're going to lay it on the deck and walk all over it and, and you know, not keep it clean, I'd suggest, yes, you should disinfect it between every fish. But if you keep it reasonably clean and dry is important. Or use a little, like I said, a little splash of alcohol. Just a splash in the bottom of that, that's plenty good enough for using fish, you know, fish after fish after fish. Hey, Mikey, how are you? <laughs> good to see you here. I'm glad to see some people I know. <laughs> but um, it's much like a hook, a needle will dull. Huff. Okay. You don't, you can run these needles over a very fine stone, drag it across to sharpen up the tips again. And I have needles in my boat that I've used for years and they've stayed sharp enough. As long as you don't jam them into something hard, the tip stays pretty sharp. Um, you know, if you find yourself not being able to, you know, pierce a fish, which I never have, but if you find yourself, then you can just get a replacement. Um, you can, um, or, or just sharpen it on a, a real fine stone. Just drag it across a few times and that's all right too. They can last years and years. So the reason I get repeat business mostly is because people lose them. <laughs> Are there any states that prohibit fizzing fish? Not that I know of. Um, 
the Virginia CD years ago told me that it would be illegal for somebody to have hypodermic needles in their boat, but that's that's no longer true. So I don't know of any. I know there are some that don't recommend it. I think maybe Michigan doesn't recommend fizzing fish. I have no idea why. I that's just weird. <laughs> I can't even understand it at this point with all the research there is behind it. And, you know, I mean, bass is so conservation oriented, they wouldn't be promoting it as a fish care technique if they, you know, if it damaged the the fish at all. So, um, I mean, it's, it's just beyond the scope of my imagination anymore. <laughs> it's hard. Some people learn slow. <laughs> and to me, politicians out there, I'll just say that. <laughs> yeah, that, no, that's, that's true. Politicians that don't have a clue about what you know what they're uh, <laughs> talking about. So, anyways, what else? Um, more so, questions? Or right, where can they where can they get your fizz kits at? Well, um, their uh, bait works has them online. B a i t w r x. They carry them, and you can message me on Facebook at any time. And uh, I send them out every week all year long. So, hey, there's Mr. Jason Wood, I think. Yep. Can a fish need to be fizzed more than once? Okay. That's a very good question. Um, if, if you're nervous doing it and you don't take enough air out the first time and you find your fish floating again, yes. Um, I'd probably do it on the other side maybe, but let's talk a little bit about neutral buoyancy. When we stick a needle in a fish, we're trying to get that fish neutrally buoyant so it neither sinks nor floats. So when you take that needle out of the fish, it should just kind of suspend itself in the water. It shouldn't be floating at the surface, nor should it sink like a rock. If, you, if it sinks like a rock, you've taken too much out, but it will repressurize itself. So if you, it's probably better to take too much out than not enough because a fish that has too much air in it cannot even manage its own swim bladder anymore. They just can't. The blood, once a fish's swim bladder is inflated, what happens is it puts so much pressure on the internal organs instead of the heart pumping blood, expanding, contracting, and pumping blood, the heart output of blood just completely just goes in the toilet. The, the, it's hardly moving any blood. So if the heart's not pumping blood through its blood vessels, that means there's no blood going through the gills. That means the fish isn't doing what? It's not breathing. So if the fish isn't breathing and offloading waste, it gets very acidotic bloodstream. And the little gland that runs the... The reet mirabal, it's called the reet mirabal. That actually puts gas into and out of the swim bladder. But that only does it within a normal pH, which is 7.35 to 7.45. And when these fish get acidotic, their blood pH goes down to like 6, 8, 6, 5. And they, that little gland can't function any, anymore. So if we leave a fish inflated, we've actually removed the ability of that fish to manage their own swim bladder. So if you ever want them to swim again, you have to release some of the gas for them and get them back to where they can breathe. The heart can pump blood, they can breathe and then start managing their own swim bladder again. So it's, it's, it's really physiologically a necessary thing once they get overinflated. That's why the, the fin clips don't work. So yes, it, you can fizz a fish more than once, a couple of years ago, we caught a whole bunch of them for people that were up practicing on the St. Lawrence River for the Elite Series, people that weren't lucky enough to catch fish in practice. And we fished some of those fish three times and kept them overnight. <laughs> and we released them all. Um, and they were just fine. They didn't suffer post-puncturing mortality. So anyways. Shout see. out my boy, uh, Javon and uh, Jeremy May. What's up, Mr. May? You don't have to wait till you come north, Jeremy, to learn how to take care of the fish. <laughs> yeah. 
You can learn right here how to take care of your fish. <laughs> Howdy to everybody new. <laughs> um, I, I don't really have an online store. You just message me on Facebook. That's, that's I guess, my online store. I'm not real uh, uh, savvy with setting up pages and stuff. But um, anyways, alkalinity, I like it. <laughs> Mr. Eric Barker. Out, My God, there's a blast from the past. I miss New York fishing. I bet you do. I miss you. How's that? <laughs> Richard says hello. <laughs> hello, Mr. Barker. You should come back up. Or take you out on the boat anytime. <laughs> That's fun. I like seeing people. Salt City needs more people. <laughs> oh, awful good to see you. We had some fun fishing together, that's for sure. But back to fizzing anyways. Um, it's really the hardest part of the technique that needs the most um, refinement and it is the neutral buoyancy. When you have a fish that's floating. I can't do this with my hands very well. But if that fish is, say, the top of my hand will be the surface of the water, and my hand is the fish. So that fish is floating, just floating on the top of the water. Let me stick a needle in there so we can see. And all right, the reamer's out of him. So that fish is just floating with that needle sticking out of him, okay? He's floating and floating. And imagine there's bubbles coming out of the top of this. As he's losing air, he floats a little less. So you'll see him start to, like, just drop a little bit in the water. And once he, this is the surface of the water now, once he pulls away from the surface of that water, once he starts to drop, you pull that needle right out. You don't waste a second because that neutral buoyancy part is there's a real fine line between too much, just enough, and not enough. So it's it's really a fine line that you get. But every fish you do, you get better at discerning that fine line. So, and people always want to ask me, oh, well, you know, you don't have to buy a kit. I can just get needles at TSC. And yes, you can. Let's see, i got to show you. But what makes this, what makes the procedure um, frustrating and why it was so slow to take off was because people were using just plain needles. They had no reamer in them. And what happens is when you stick this into a fish, the little needle gets stuck with little pieces of muscle tissue in there. And it blocks the needle. So people were stabbing the fish and not getting bubbles. And they were thinking, oh, I'm in the wrong spot. So they would take the needle out and stab the fish in another spot. Nice. And they wouldn't get bubbles there either because the needle was plugged. So the fish would end up being like a pin cushion. Then they get discouraged and they'd say, well, I'm not, this is, this is a bunch of hooey. I'm going to go back to mouth fizzing. And that's part of the reason this technique took so long to take off. But when I ran into my own troubles with it, I devised this reamer. Oh, let me see there that fits into the needle and you put it out of the way when you first insert the needle. And then when the needle is in the fish, let's see if I can get this. When the needles in the fish, you tap the reamer and that little reamer is cut just exactly so it clears the end of the needle. See how that does that? And that's, that, that is the key to making this successful 100% of the time. There, there's, if you follow the landmarks and put this needle in the fish, and tap that reamer, pull the reamer out, you will, be, you will be getting bubbles every time. There's just, there's no reason not to. It works. It's one of the few things about fishing that, works 100% of the time. 
So it's almost like a clean out. It's like a clean out. Maybe. Yeah, it is. But you don't have the the thing is there are other needles out there that have a reamer that you put in when you're done. But this is the only needle out there that you leave in there while you're fizzing it, and you don't have to take the the reamer out the needle out of the fish to clean it. So you clean it while it's in the fish. Got you. Yeah. If if you want to see some some uh, videos. You can Google my name, Barb Elliott, and uh, the word fizzing, and a lot of the good videos will pop up. When should you use fin clips? Um, I'm not a big fan of fin clips. Um, you can use them as a stopgap measure. If you can't say you've got fish in a schooling situation or something, and you're catching them one right after another, you can put fin clips on them just so they don't struggle. But fin clips do not. I repeat, they do not fix the internal problem. The fish is still, if you took those clips off, the fish is still going to go upside down and be overpressurized. And once they're overpressurized, they can't pump enough blood to fix themselves anymore. So that's part of the problem. So I don't recommend fin clips. It takes maybe 15 seconds, 20 maybe. If you got everything right there, it just takes a few seconds to fizz a fish. I just... And the more you do, the better you get, and the quicker you get. So um, I just recommend fizzing them. It's it's really easy. I know people get skeeved out about the needles a little bit, but it's much better for the fish to have a little tiny hole in their side and release that gas than it is for them to go eight hours floating around and getting injured and beat up and, and dying after the tournament because that's what's going to happen to them. So Definitely. it's not good. I mean, I don't, I've never used fin clips. I just always fizz my fish. And that's, is a live well additive a good idea, G juice? Do you recommend using ice or frozen bottle? Ah, that's a good question. My experience, which I'll tell you, just my own personal experience, I never use additives. Um, I will freeze uh, water in uh, Gatorade bottles. And, um, I, if it's really warm out, like the air temperatures in the upper 80s, 90s, I will put the frozen water bottles in the live well when we stop to fish. You have to remember to take them out when you run because it's just like a rock in there bouncing around a little beat your fish to death. But you can put them back in at the other end when you stop again. And definitely have some frozen um, Gatorade bottles uh, if you're taking the boat out and parking in a parking lot in really warm weather, because that's when those that water heats up terrible. Because now the bottom of the boat's not in the water and it's getting the heat reflected off the pavement. It's just it. The warmer the water is, the less oxygen it holds. So that's you can kind of you don't want to be changing the temperature in the water and the on these fish more than five or six degrees at the most. But I figure if those fish are living in the water that we take them out of, how I manage my live wells is I run my research pumps and my fill pumps together on a timer all day. So all throughout the day, I'm getting the water recirculated, but I'm also replacing, every time those pumps turn on, I replace a certain amount of the water. It gets rid of waste products and brings fresh oxygenated, oxygenated water into the live well. So that's how I run my boat, and I've I don't normally have fish die. I guess I've had a few die over the years, but um, for other reasons than oxygen content in the water. But it's it's really it becomes crucial when the air temperature is warm, the upper 80s, 90s. You guys down south put up with that. I don't know how how you do, but I can't even function in that kind of weather. But <laughs> but that's a very good question. Um, now the summer, I, the yeah. summer, the, the most you see uh, more fizzing in the summer than other seasons, or about the same, or um, I probably the bass spend more time shallow in the spring because they've been spawning, and they typically spawn. I mean, everyone thinks they spawn shallow, and I I don't enjoy bed fishing, but people get all out of whack about bed fishing but for every fish you see spawning in shallow water there's 
equally as many spawning out in 10, 15, 20 feet where you don't see them so easy. Um, I think if bed fishing was going to hurt our bass populations, it would have done so a long time ago because uh, bed fishing has been going on for as long as people have been catching fish, I think. But like I said, I don't enjoy it. But I mean, when you're fishing for $100,000, I can see why somebody would want to, you know, maybe capitalize on some big fish that they find. But um, I, I saw that on Lake Cumberland here in Kentucky. Uh, water was up. And like where the original shoreline was, it was like 12 foot deep. They were spawning on the original shoreline. And I, I could see them down there. Yeah, yeah. We've seen fish in Oneida Lake. I mean, when it's real clear, we've seen fish bedding 20 feet of water. I mean, wow. yeah, it's, and on, it's a thousand islands. It happens, you know, up in the St. Lawrence. It happens all the time. Yeah, that's because the water's so clear there. It doesn't matter. So, yeah. Hey, my buddy Javon down in Miss, he lives in South Mississippi. Where I used to live. Said it was a hundred and five ish this year, in Mississippi. That that's why I'm in Kentucky, Javon. Uh, I I just I would be a big puddle. I can't take that kind of heat. I've been a northern northern <laughs> the, the girl all my life. Brutal. The humidity <laughs> would get you down there. Yeah, that's that's just uh, no, that's that's unnatural to me. Yeah. I can't do it. 105 ish this year in Mississippi. It was rough. Well, you yep. guys have a lot of tournaments in uh at night, don't you? Yeah, in the summer, even Kentucky here, we have a lot of night tournaments. 98 degree water temperature this year. I mean, that would just kill any good smallmouth. It just yep. wouldn't that wouldn't uh you know, they, they don't like that kind of no. stuff very well. Yeah. I mean, when you're fishing the St. Lawrence, you can look 30 feet down. It's just like you're looking through glass yeah i mean it's it's so clear and when i fish muddy water i get all worked up because i don't know what the heck i'm doing i know a lot of you southern guys come up here and fish clear water it's like ah! <laughs> but i'd much rather fish clear water of course it's all what you're used to so yeah but that's funny <laughs> yeah the other thing that's different up here is our hazard buoys yeah um mark hazards <laughs> the first time we ever went to lake fork it was the hardest thing we had to do to follow the boat trails that are marked with the the yep. buoys like that oh lord we thought we were driving into rock piles and it just felt so eerie and so unnatural you know driving towards these buoys and we saw i think it was on cayuga lake we saw one guy just flying in going shallow and he's heading right for this shoal that's marked with a hazard buoy you know and we're thinking he's just going to crash tear the bottom half of his motor off and he gets right on top of the shoal and all of a sudden you hear him shut the motor right down and curve right out and he came motoring over by us he says how come those buoys are that's that's a rock pile there it's like yeah it's a rock pile up here they mark them different than you guys have down there so that's like speaking a different language let's see the pearl river here is about 10 feet of visibility you can wow. see it will go all the way down well that's kind of cloudy up here but <laughs> well usually down there i mean you're, you're talking about two or three inches they've had so much drought down there i mean it's that's crazy yeah. i mean growing up you get, if two or three inches of water visibility that was clear so wow yeah, that's, that's crazy. That's why you guys had those, the color disc where you could see what colors you could see better. Yeah. In the, that's that's why all that came about. Yeah. Because you had to have it. It's yeah. just unbelievable. You talk about buoys. Cherokee Lake's <laughs> bad. You know, when Cherokee Lake gets dropped down, most of these islands and stuff, it's not marked. Duh. You'll go 40 foot to four foot like that, and you're like, <laughs> oh. Yeah, make you sucker. <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> Real quick. But anyway, the 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 biggest thing about fizzing is to do it out on the on the out on the water at catch time. That's how you're gonna help the fish the most. It's it doesn't hurt them. Large mouth, small mouth, spots, it doesn't matter. Like I said, the litmus test to figure out if you need to fizz your fish is to put it in the live well, shut your pumps off. So the water's not swirling it around and just see what that fish does. If you dump him in there and he, he goes down and he, he's down in the bottom, his little pectoral fins are just 
you know, holding himself there and he looks happy. And he's good to go. You know, I've caught fish in Oneida in 15 or 20 feet of water, never had to fizz them. I've caught fish in the St. Lawrence in two feet of water, had them go belly up instantly. And the wow. reason the reason it's so special up there is because the shallow water access is so close to deep water. They spend all their days in 40 to 50 feet of water. And when they get hungry, they swim up for a little while. So their swim bladder's tuned for 40 or 50 feet of water. And they just come up in two, three, four feet of water. And they're looking for a quick meal and to go back down. But unfortunately, their quick meal puts them on my hook and gets them in my boat. And you have to understand why this barotrauma happens, too. Um, a cubic foot of water weighs, yeah, I can't remember now, 60 pounds or something like that. A cube, one foot by one foot by one foot weighs like 60 pounds just say 60 pounds for now i don't know exactly what it is don't quote me so when you have a fish that's still in two feet of water it has two cubic feet of water squishing that swim bladder there's that much pressure 120 pounds of pressure is squishing that swim bladder small when you yank that fish up that final two feet so you've got it at like you know sea level pressure where there's no water over it air doesn't weigh anything it doesn't put any pressure on the swim bladder that swim bladder just expands exponentially that's why when you catch fish on your boat and you're not gonna fizz them you give them a good nose dive send off down into the water and they swim hard for that two feet and then they swim off easy you know that's because they're losing that buoyancy that uh swim bladder is getting compressed again like if you had a balloon that was as big as your head and you start at the surface and you go down 10 feet, that balloon would be half the size at, at 10 or 12 feet, something like that anyways, that it would be going back up to the surface, it gets big again. And then going back down, that, that pressure from that water, the weight of that water just shrinks that balloon. It doesn't work on water water doesn't compress just like in a hydraulic system that's why hydraulics work but gases do compress and that's why you have so much of a dynamic situation with a swim bladder when you yank that fish out of the water that's what causes it so makes sense makes sense yeah little science gets a little i start talking partial pressures and people start <laughs> crossing their eyes and look at me funny but <laughs> it's all explained by science so yeah. You should fizz fish even if you immediately release them. Uh, you don't have to, no. If you immediately release that fish and you give that fish a good aerodynamic nose dive send off into the water, um, that fish should be, be able to power down and get to where it's neutrally buoyant again. Um, but I've had people tell me that they've caught fish in deep water and gone to let them go fish are individuals just like people some struggle and fight and some just say eh i'm gonna give up and they float back up to the surface so we've i've had people tell me they've had to take a little air out of their fish that they're just catching releasing to get you know get them to go back down to where they are neutrally buoyant so yeah. you just have to you know be aware and uh take care of the fish to the best of your ability <laughs> yeah so I mean, the, the, the other thing with the comparing southern to northern fish, our fish up here take a lot longer to grow. Um, a lot of the fish, the trophy-sized smallmouth that we catch up on the river up here, like the five and a halves and sixes and the bigger ones like that, right. those fish are 15 to 20 years old. Wow. 20 plus. That's how long it takes these smallmouth to get that big up here. So to have that fish get caught once in a tournament and just be killed out of mismanagement is just a travesty. It's, yeah. it's a crime, really. It takes, you know, the, these fish are older than a lot of the people fishing for them. So yeah. <laughs> it's just, you know, it's take it. they just don't grow fast. They're in ice water basically six months out of the year, whereas down south they eat 24-7, 365. So you can get a five pound bass in five years down there, but not up here. It's, it's very, okay. very different. So that was 
makes these fish very special. They're, uh, it's, it's quite a thing to hook a, I guess it was 10 or 12 years ago, I caught a six pound smallmouth in Shamo Bay. And I just about, I just about fell over. They just, <laughs> they look so different. You know, when they get that big, their heads look real small and they're, they're. They got the football they, shape. They got the yeah, football. They don't yeah. get longer. They just get bigger around. Yep. And they just get, that's why they call them footballs. Cause they don't even look like the same fish anymore. When you catch a big one like that. Oh yeah. Memorable experience. So let's see. Fishing St. Lawrence and Lake Ontario of your tournament. Oh yeah. Some of the some of the launches um in the summertime are in bays and marinas. And uh we very often leave boats in the water and after we weigh the fish in, we'll shuttle out two or three bags of fish to cooler water because one of the reasons I became conservation director for New York Bass Nation was um, we had a tournament. Well, there were two clubs fishing the same Shimo Bay launch. And the club that was fishing in front of us were high five five in themselves. And they were having 20 and 22 pound bags. And it was like 95 degrees out. And the release area at Shimo Bay um releases into like a shallow swampy kind of really hot water and i'm sure that water there was 95 plus degrees and they were letting these smallmouth go and they were just popping up dead i mean they were all over the place so i hired a guy with a little jet ski boat yeah and i got a net and i went around netting these dead fish because there must have been 30 of them I, I did they just kept coming up dead, uh, 30 or 40 of them. We had bags and bags of fish. And I paid this guy, I took 20 bucks out of my pocket and said, Hey, can you ferry me around? And, you know, cause I didn't want all those dead fish. Um, they were just going to blow into the people's private houses and, you know, the shoreline and what better way to get a bad name for bass fishing than have, yeah. you know, 30 or 40 dead fish blow up in your yard. Oh, yeah. I afraid we were going to be banned. So that's what got me headed down the conservation <laughs> road, I guess I should say. But um, yeah, it's it's smallmouth up here are very, very sensitive in the summer times to that lack of oxygen and water temperature. I got so, you. Yeah. But I mean, as are all fish anywhere, the, the largemouth tolerated a lot better, but those smallies will not. And it's just amazes me to this day that all the weigh-in bags are black. If you have a weigh-in bag and it's black, spray paint it white, please, because those bags absorb heat. That heat transfers to the water instantly. It raises the temperature. You know, people say, oh, I'm too long in the weigh-in line bag. It's like, first of all, put enough water in your bag. It should be hard to carry. And yep. second of all, paint them white because that reflects the heat. And you, your fish, you will be amazed at how much better your fish are. It, it, it makes a huge difference. Right. Those black bags just make that water instantly like gain 10, 15 degrees. And that oxygen just evaporates out of that water. It can't stay in there. It just won't hold them. I got you. I got you. Makes sense. Yeah, it does. So paint your way in bags white. Yeah. Yeah, the same thing happened at Pickwick a few years back, but huh? You the the Javen Cuevas, mm -hmm. um, were they the fish were floating or what was what was the deal, or they were just dying? It could be uh, I'd have to find out more about um exactly what was going on if you could tell me more. But that that's typically what happens with the fish. That's why we don't like to give a lot of people weigh in bags and have a long line with, because once you bag those fish up, that oxygen is completely limited and standing in the sun, it's like, yeah, no, it's it. <laughs> it just, the oxygen is just depleted instantly. So gotcha. you can just, I mean, it's an easy fix. You just spray paint the bags white and it works good. So anyway, um, is your time up? No, we got time. I just wanted to uh, get, try to get some questions for you. Yeah. 
I'm trying to think of what people ask me. I used to have people telling me all the time that, oh, if you fizz a large mouth, you'll kill it. No, that you can fizz them just like you do small mouth. I had a tournament on Cayuga Lake one time. All the fish I caught were between 20 and 30 feet on a little small tube. And uh, every one of them were large mouth. And uh, I fizzed every one of them. So they, they, they typically um, will survive a little bit more abuse than the small mouth with temperature and, you know, over fizzing, but they don't like to be, you know, over pressurized any more than the smallies do. It just completely hampers their circulation. They were healthy throughout the weigh-in, but once they released, they would float up and die. Yeah. This was when live scope first became popular. The catching the first time 30 feet offshore. Yeah, that's probably exactly what happened. Um, they just, they were overpressurized and, and, uh, they just pop up to the surface and they can't, once they're overpressurized, they can't pump their own blood because the cardiac output just goes in the toilet because of the pressure from the swim bladder. I mean, it's like, imagine if somebody put a balloon in your belly button and then blew it up, how uncomfortable you would feel and how much it would impact the rest of your organs. You know, it, it does the same exact thing to a fish. That's exactly what happens to them. Their swim bladder just expands exponentially. Hey, Eric, it was really good to see you. <laughs> we missed you up here. You transplant. <laughs> but I, like, I enjoy fishing down south. I fished at Fork. My personal best is eight and a half from Fork. Um, cut that on swim bait. bait. No, it didn't need fizzing, but I fish too. I mean, I know what it's like to fish tournaments. So I, I can appreciate people worrying about their time and stuff, but the 15 to 20 seconds it's going to take you to fizz that fish, that keeps them alive. It keeps them from, from floating. Definitely fizz your fish before you take off on a long run, because if they're floating at the top and your live wells aren't full, that washing machine effect just beats the crap out of those fish you know their eyes get white they get physically bruised all yeah. over and it takes them if they live it takes them weeks to recover you know from all the bruising so that's really that's another thing you know you have live wells that are you know 24 inches deep fill them up with water do yeah. not leave these some of these people bring me fish to show them how to fish. There's not enough water in the live well to float the fish, let alone you know, transport them around. Keep your live wells filled. The more water is in there, the more oxygen's in there too. And that's yeah. that's a really important thing. So, yeah, I see guys use the uh, the swimming noodles up through section of swimming noodles. Yeah, I've, I've seen them do that. Those are really good to keep the fish from bouncing against the top. A lot of people have their cull clips and things, you know, glued to the end or, you know, mounted to the inside of the top of their lid. Well, if that water sloshing around, that fish goes up and hits those things at the top of the live well. It's like, you know, you're sitting there with a metal piece of metal beating these fish. Yeah. So the, the pool noodles really help that. I like to use them to, um, they're kind of a pain to handle. Right. Well, do you have to fizz in the live well? Can you do it out of the live well? Um, the more fish you fizz, the better you get at it. You can take the fish out of the live well to place the needle when you're first doing it and then put the fish back in the live well to float it. And that's how you check the neutral buoyancy. Okay. The second that fish pulls away from the surface of the water, you yank that needle out. Um, I, I, I've done so many. I just fizz them in the water and you, anybody that fizzes fish will get to that point too. You know, where you can just, some people just, you know, take them out of the water halfway and place the needle, then float them in the water. But that's the beauty of fizzing through the side. You can float them in the water. And so you can determine that neutral buoyancy point exactly. When people fizz through the mouth, they had no idea whether they were taking out too much or not enough, or they just, you know, let the, let the air, the gas out of the swim bladder through the mouth and then throw it back in and hope for the best. So it was very inexact and very harmful to the fish. So side fizzing is, uh, hello, Mr. John Henning. 
It's going very well. On your way to work. Do you work nights? I work nights too. I can appreciate that. <laughs> but we have about five minutes. Okay. Um, the only other thing I can think of with is to keep enough water in your live wells. Um, like I said, I'm not keep sure the, what's going on with your mic. Sorry. Yeah. Just keep your live wells filled and keep um, keep your fill and your research pumps on timed all day. So you're constantly getting a little bit of water recirculation and fresh water being brought in. And uh, fizz your fish if you need them. And the litmus test to do that is just put your fish in the live well and see where that fish goes. If he goes right to the bottom and sits there looking at you, it's a funny thing. If you, if you catch a fish that needs fizzing, and you just put him in your live well and you don't do anything to him and you go back to fishing, you will hear that fish in the back of that boat thumping around your live well, swimming, he's jumping up, hitting the lid, and people say, ooh, he's all pissed off, you know, because we caught him. It's like not, he's not pissed, he's not mad. He's actually feeling the pressure of that swim bladder exerting uncomfortable pressure on his body and he knows what he needs to do to fix it. He's trying to get to deep water. That's what that fish is trying to do. Gotcha. So, good point. Yeah. You, you, uh, people anthropomorphize about that all the time, but he's not mad. He's just trying to get to deeper water. And all you have to do to make him comfortable, make him last in your life well, all day is just fizz him. Keeps him happy. Makes so, sense. Good point. Yeah. So. And keep the live wells clean. Yes, I do live well checks sometimes for tournaments. It's like I open those live wells and the stuff that you smell coming, it smells like a garbage dump. It's like you're going to put water and fish in there. It's like, oh, no, that's horrible. And the biggest thing you can do when you get home, just open your live well lids. Just let them air dry. That's the best thing. You know, you can scrub them out with a little bleach water if you want to, but just open the live well lids and your bilge compartment too that's really a good tip yeah yeah yes please clean your wife live wells good point remo <laughs> uh live well cleaning tips just uh a weak bleach solution um you can you know use a little hydrogen peroxide diluted in water but hydrogen peroxide is not the oxygen generator people think it is it harms gills do not use it on your fish uh that's not good any kind of uh, just a weak bleach solution and rinse well. And the biggest thing is let it air dry. Just let it air dry. Good thing. Makes yeah. sense. Yeah. All right. Thank you guys for having me. Hey, we appreciate you. A lot of good tips. Hey, I learned a lot of stuff. And uh, we really good. appreciate you coming on and sharing your knowledge with us. Yeah. Well, thanks for having me. Anybody interested, just uh, get a hold of me on Facebook or go to Baitworks. And uh, you can get your very own fizz kit there. Right there. Great, great illustrations on that, too. Great illustrations yeah. on the fish. Love it. I uh, I wrote, and there's, you should read all the instructions. I wrote the instructions long before I had good video. So the instructions are very detailed. You don't even need to watch a video. So, all right. Thank you, gentlemen. All right. Thank you all. Have a good night, everybody. Uh, Thanks for tuning in, and I'm sure we'll have Miss Barb on again soon. She's a wealth of knowledge for sure. But, uh, <laughs> thank you, Miss Barb, and uh, thank you, John. We'll uh, be talking to you again uh, next Wednesday night, 8 o'clock. All right. Good night, guys. Good night. Hey, Amen. <laughs>